It's been a difficult couple of years, hasn't it? What have you missed the most? It's a common question and the answers change. For many people, I think they really missed hugs. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Hugs give us something that doesn't neatly fit into a chart. The heart is where we feel the warmth of a, of a hug. The heart is the first organ to form in the body during development. That's incredible. So maybe we should pay some more attention to it. The idea of heart for breathing, of adding intention to what we feel and what we do, can bring new perspectives to what we mean by productivity. The heart isn't measured, the hug isn't measured by the way we measure productivity. What does it even mean to be productive today when productivity erases your entire identity and existence? And who truly benefits from productivity? What if we put people over productivity? What if you went from philandering productivity to philanthropic productivity? What if you took a lesson from the Hunt Blackwell who work, travel, and live in pods and protect other species, not just their own? What if you went from productivity to productivity? Working in pods, sharing our unique talents and strengths for the benefit of the whole. Before industrialization, the concept of disability did not exist. It was coined for bodies that could not contribute to the industrial process. This talk is about reframing productivity. What does it mean to be worthy? Who decides who is worthy? And who benefits from things staying the same? Why is productivity a contest, especially in the global pandemic? What if you went from philandering productivity to philanthropic productivity? Philandering productivity meaning no one not seeing people as inherently valuable, only as a utility. Number two, using people in a transactional approach. Number three, not being mindful of people's needs, as personified, for example, by Donald Trump. So what if you went from philandering productivity to philanthropic productivity, meaning number one, seeing ourselves as inherently valuable. Number two, an inclusive, equitable, and intersectional approach. Number three, a more loving approach, being mindful of other people's needs, as could be personified by you, by all of us. When we take the philanthropic productivity approach, we create a diverse palette that makes life richer and brings, us, brings a wealth of different skills and experiences. You know, at the start, we said we missed hugs. Well, for people who have been missing hugs for a year, I've been missing them for 35 years. Imagine you're at an event and someone joins the conversation with the people you're talking with. They give everyone you're talking to a hug, except for you. This is often the situation I am in. Being underestimated and facing adversity every day 
has its advantages. I never take anything or anyone for granted. One breath at a time. Because for many of us, a day at a time can be too tough. Because radical healing demands radical dreaming. And then there's something I often felt disadvantaged by. I'm not on the inside. What does it mean to be in? In fashion? On the inside track? Are you with the in crowd? I'm here to tell you that if you want to reach our full potential, we all need to be in. I'm here to tell you that we need to recognize our inherent value, that inclusivity needs to be a way of life, not just to box the tick, and that interdependence trumps independence every time. Follow these three rules and you really can all be in a world that has philanthropic productivity at its heart. Let's look at those three ideas in some more detail. You may not think that we need to even discuss the inherent value of life, everyone's life, today in 2021. And yet we do. When the former Supreme Court judge says that not all life is equal, what does that say about the journey ahead of us? We remain stuck at base camp. Doctors told my parents that I would not live past five years old. I've outlived and outdefied doctors, teachers, extended family, and society's expectations of me. Normative and ableist narrative states that someone with a complex disability like me should have very low function, little emotional intelligence, and an inactive life. And we appreciate the inherent value in ourselves and others, we can appreciate ourselves and everyone, no matter who they are or what they can do. We can take a great example of this altruism from the animal kingdom. Humpback whales protect other animals, whether humpback whales are not in the ocean against attack, even against orcas. Scientists don't know why this is, but some theories suggest altruism. This altruism creates a shared sense of belonging through inclusivity. But you can't be inclusive if everyone is not included. The greatest leaps made by humanity have been made through inclusivity. My personal experience of inclusivity is one of struggle and challenge. For the first 10 years of my life, I was required to go to a special school in East London, where all we did all day long was sing nursery rhymes. And to this day, I now know every nursery rhyme by heart, and something I might even add to my CV. In short, it was a segregated school. I never even learned to read and write until I was 10. When we moved to the US, we were there for over 10 years. Very quickly, I was put into mainstream classes in mainstream schooling. However, for the first year, I didn't realize I had to do something called homework, and I got in so much trouble for not doing it. Once I really started putting my mind to work, I thrived. I got straight A's and was integrated into school and into society. Now you can't shut me up. <laughs> and you can't stop me from going places. However, often, the only way I can get into a building is through a good lift. And there's so many examples where I've been stuck in a good lift 
I said, there's lots of interesting scenarios that happen to me around the good lift. But what happens in the good lift stays in the good lift. <laughs> It's 2021, and the lack of inclusivity for disabled people is shocking. February 2015 was another great example of inclusivity or that thereof. I bought tickets to go to a concert with my younger brother to see one of my favorite artists. I contacted the venue several times to see if it was really accessible with no response whatsoever. Once I arrived, it became very apparent that the concert was upstairs and there was no road to access. I then saw the artist by the bar. I went up to her to let her know that I might need to go home. She was quite upset and insisted we have to get me upstairs. She then asked her entire band, plus my brother, to lift my 500 and 50 pound Ute up the stairs. There was no luck. It was too heavy and too difficult for five people to do so. So in the end, my brother ended up carrying up two flights of stairs without my wheelchair and held me up on the bench for the entire gig. Though it was a fantastic adventure, the lack of inclusivity was apparent and often the case for disabled people who just want to live our lives. Thanks to the good will of, of the land and, and, and my brother, the situation was salvaged. Though in an inclusive and interdependent world, they knew, never would have needed to do so. Finally, interdependence. The pandemic has proved what disabled people have been saying for some time. The advantages of philanthropic productivity have never been clearer than now. Working from home, no problem. Sexual working, entirely doable. Self-care, self-evident. Whether we embrace that or will we go back to how it was before? After graduating, it took me three years to get my first job. Ableism and inaccessibility closed off work experiences and internships. Even the recruiting process was not accessible. This felt devastating. I worked just as hard and proactively wanted to get a job. For me and many disabled people, the outdated model of work was already broken long before COVID-19 proved it. Projects that have a sense of urgency or need to be done quickly by one person are quite difficult for me. This is because it doesn't take our needs into account and acts as, uh, as being productive as a commodity. But this is now commonplace of people juggling homeschooling and caring responsibilities with working from home. And good companies find simple solutions. Back in 2016, I had to start my own business due to extreme ableism and, uh, extreme ableism and inaccessible work environments. My disabled global family had known for the longest time valuing the importance of restful activism and restful activism and the knowledge of knowing that interdependence is more significant than independence. Personally, for me it's about aligning, resting, reflecting and replenishing over constant hustling. For me it's about progression over perfection. For, for many disabled people and myself, what we are asking for is value us, pay us, credit us, give us access. What's the one thing that 
connects all of this? It's my heart. In the past, the Egyptians thought that the heart was the most important organ and the source of the intellect. When we breathe with the, with the heart, we can recognize our inherent value that inclusivity needs to be a way of life and that interdependence trumps independence every time. Are you in? Thank you very much.